Hello and welcome to another Fully Charged News Update. Just very quickly at the beginning, I'm going to mention a few Patreon names. I know some people have asked me to do that at the end, but it, sometimes I forget. It's very difficult, but I just want to uh, thank, it's only four, very quickly, Mr. Beardy McBeardface. <laughs> thank you, Beardy. Greg Malmborg, Jan Detflesen, and Simon Yap. Now, we'll be hearing more from Simon Yap next year. Very exciting stuff. Before I start, I just want to put one kind of annoying story to bed. It's basically the electric cars are more dirty than diesel because of all the particulates they leave from their brakes and tyres. You may have heard of this one because they're heavier. And many of you, I'm sure, will have seen it. It's been in hundreds of newspaper headlines, hundreds of BBC reports. Constantly, the BBC regurgitate this old rubbish. Let me tell you why it's old rubbish. This report came from Edinburgh University, which sounds very legitimate and proper. Edinburgh University is one of the finest universities in the country. Uh, then it emerged that it was actually an undergraduate who wrote a report for a Norwegian diesel parts manufacturer. Uh, so then Edinburgh University asked for its name to be withdrawn from the report, which it was, and then the report was withdrawn altogether because it was totally fabricated nonsense. But the newspapers still print it. Anyone who drives an electric vehicle knows that one of the problems with electric vehicles is you don't use the brakes very much. One of the first uh, electric cars I ever drove uh, in California, the owner lived very near the sea in Santa Monica, and he had to use his brakes every morning when he first drove off. He had to pump them to clean the rust off that, that had formed overnight from the salty air. That is more of a problem. You don't use brakes very much on an electric car, much, much less than you do on conventional vehicles. Tires don't wear out more they wear out less. And then there's the kettle story. Oh, I love the kettle story. Uh, if you boil a kettle while you're charging your car, uh, you will, your, ca uh, your fuses will trip on your house or you'll melt the wires or you'll set fire to your whole neighborhood. That's what it said in the Times newspaper, in the Times. And they said this came from a national grid study. Except they just cherry picked the bits they wanted to hear. So if you were to install an 11 kilowatt charger in your house, which no electrician would do unless you had three phase power, but if you were to do it and then you turn on your kettle while your car is charging, that would overload the household electricity supply. Yes, it would. It's true. It would. It would be very difficult. I have met one person who uses an 11, 11 kilowatt charger in their house and they did have a three phase supply. A three phase supply is the sort of supply that goes to a small commercial unit, a small factory, a small office block. Somewhere where they use a lot more power than you do in a house. So everyone who's got an electric car has a seven kilowatt charger. And now I checked this morning, I boiled the kettle while the car was charging and nothing happened. So the, the, I, the boiling your kettle story is utter, total, fabricated nonsense. Anyway, moving on. Now, I'm going to get a little bit nerdy now, so please bear with me. That a recent study from the Carbon Trust and Imperial College in London suggests that a flexible grid, a flexible grid, mm, new term, like it, would reduce costs uh, of powering the country by up to £40 billion by 2050. £40 billion. Pounds. Sounds like quite a lot of money to me. They studied 12 different scenarios for electricity demand and technology costs, and the report shows that a flexible grid would save between 17 and £40 billion pounds, uh, between now and 2050. So what is a flexible grid? I mean, I don't, I've never heard of it before. Well, it's a combination of smart technologies and microgrids. So you have a big grid and then you have microgrids and you have mini grids. Your house effectively is a mini grid. Uh, and widely distributed generation and storage, like I've got at this house, solar panels on the roof, battery in the, in the garage, uh, and also vehicle to grid systems for electric cars. But also, and really importantly, it is a system that takes advantage of supply and demand and the costs associated with that. Because that's what we as consumers never know, that the price of electricity is doing this all the time. It's going up and down and up and down like crazy. Sometimes it goes negative and you get paid to use electricity. We don't, not us consumers, but big uh, factories and oil refineries, they get paid to use electricity when there is an oversupply of electricity and the price goes negative. It's happened twice now in this country. It happens regularly in Germany. It really messes things up. I'm not saying this is a good thing. This is part of the disruption that is being caused by all this new technology. The, the underlying hint here is that renewables are actually cheaper because they'll still produce electricity even when we don't need it, which is far more common than not producing it when we do. People always go on about, oh, what happens when it's not sunny? 
it, it does, it, it's not, that's not the problem. What happens when it is sunny and we've got loads of electricity? That's more important. How do we use that electricity? Because it's effectively free. There's no fuel costs involved. Once the installation's there, once the installation's paid for, which doesn't take that long, two to five years, once that's happened, you've got free electricity. What are you going to do with that? We should store it to use it when electricity is more expensive. And that's what all these things are going on about. Now, it's worth reading this whole article if you're interested. It, it, it's fairly deep and complicated. But this stuff, this is the stuff I've been hearing about at all the conferences I've been attending. I've been attending, me, I've been attending energy conferences. Now, if you imagine, go back 10 or maybe even 20 years and imagine how dull an energy conference would have been. It would have been incredibly boring. But now, when I go to these conferences, they're like the early TED Talks. They're full of vibrancy and excitement and creativity and a huge desire to develop new systems of distributed ownership. That's something that everybody is really locked onto, that you distribute the ownership of, of electricity, household, rooftop solar, uh, community owned solar and wind, all those things owned by different people spread out over the whole country, completely changes the picture. And, uh, and uh, locally owned storage, might, lots and lots of little batteries in lots and lots of houses. Now, another bit of news, I was in Cornwall uh, a few years ago because my wife's forefathers were Cornish tin miners who went to Australia to do mining stuff. I don't know what they mined when they were in Australia, but anyway, they did. The Pascoes, very, very common Cornish name. Uh, so we went and looked at an old tin mine. It's still there, the one that her something like five times great grandfather worked on. He might have done a midnight runner. He might have been a bit dodgy. <laughs> it runs in the family. Anyway, we're not absolutely sure he was the the pit boss who legged it with all the cash in a, in a bag and got on a boat to Australia, but it might have been. But suddenly the, they, they've discovered that there is the presence of lithium in the, um, in the salt brines in Cornwall, in the old tin mines. They've known it was there since about 1860, but it's never been commercially viable to extract it. Well, now it is becoming commercially viable and Cornish lithium has raised an initial million pounds, which will allow them to, uh, to explore across various locations in Cornwall. From Camborne to Truro and they're doing that right now. Just a quick reminder, lithium makes up 2% of the mass of a lithium ion battery, 2%. There's loads of other stuff in them as well. It's not, they're not made of lithium. Greg Clark, the, the current business secretary of the current government, uh, announced the first phase of 246 million pounds of investment in battery technology in the UK over the next four years, which is really good news. I'm very pleased about that. And a Cornish lithium extraction is also going to work uh, on developing um, uh, geothermal projects in Cornwall because the uh, Eden project has a very large geothermal power plant. That's what produces most of their electricity. Uh, now, next story is about electric vehicles that earn money doing nothing. They're earning money while they're parked and charging. So I like to cover the stories that the mainstream press don't even know about, let alone ignore. So in Denmark, a fleet of 10 Nissan ENV200 vans has earned 1,300 euros over the last year, just being parked and plugged in. What the what? When there's an electric vehicle that takes electricity from the grid when it's very cheap, which is the very sensible thing to do and you do it overnight, but it's still plugged in in the morning when there's sudden rise in demand and a rise in cost per kilowatt hour, you sell some of that electricity back to the grid. You don't need all of it. You sell a bit back to the grid. It's not that much. It's not that much money. But, you know, they've earned 1,300 quid in a year, and that's just with 10 vans. Imagine 10 million vans, 10 million cars. That's an enormous amount of electricity storage and an enormous amount of potential commercial benefit for the owners slash operators of said electric vehicles. It's really hard to imagine what this will really mean on a kind of really massive grid scale, you know, once there are millions of electric vehicles. I mean, it is another aspect of what is clearly a very disruptive technology. It's going to mess stuff up. It's going to mean that very expensive power plants that we currently have to keep running, even if, we're not, even if they're not generating, they have to be kept on standby for when there are peaks in demand. If those peaks in demand are removed by the fact that there's a million electric cars plugged in, all with, you know, and you take one kilowatt hour from each of them, you've got a million kilowatt hours. I mean, it doesn't, it's not that hard to work it out. That's really going to mess things up. What do we do with all those redundant power plants and that we're paying for, even when they're not generating, which is called a subsidy. I know I keep going on about it, but it's a very important point. Anyway, I'm sure you will share your highly informed and always challenging opinions, which I love in the comments beneath this video. 
I look forward to it. You see, I'm interested to see how electric vehicles are finally making headline news this day. The Economist ran a, a front page story about the death of the internal combustion engine recently. But the arguments that they make in the article, and again, I uh, advise you to read it if you've got time. The links, all the links to all these articles will be below this video. Uh, I've heard these arguments again and again from manufacturers and academics because it's not just about cars and batteries, but it's a, which are clearly set to take over, but it's also about the ownership model. The ownership model, which I think is equally, if not more important. You have to imagine that if you had the ability to access and use a car exactly as you do now, in exactly the same way you do now, but you don't own the car. You just use it when you need it, and you don't use it when you don't need it, and someone else uses it when you don't need it. And if you need another one, another one comes and you use that one. I mean, this is the, this is the, at the moment, the kind of theory, I'm not going to say the fantasy, the theory behind a, uh, an autonomous car fleet. We'd need far less cars. So we'd have less cars littering the streets. There wouldn't be car parks. We wouldn't need them. You wouldn't need to worry about charging your car because it would already be charged and anyway. It's not your car. You wouldn't have to worry about insurance and tax and all that stuff. You just pay for the miles that you actually went on, which I would predict will be quite expensive. So I think the way we should think about transportating ourselves, I don't know if you've ever transported yourself, the way we should think about transporting ourselves is a very simple list. We should walk, we should cycle, we should use public transport, and as a fourth option, we should use autonomous electric vehicles that are already charged and don't leave more particulates than diesel. I mean, that's when the very fabric of the world we live in would change dramatically. I'm not gonna say this is easy, I'm not gonna say it's gonna happen soon, but I do think it will happen. It will happen. There's really not much we can do to stop it happening because it's gonna be generational. So the next generation will be more accepting of autonomous vehicles in the same way as we're more accepting of things like the internet that have changed everything as we all know. Now here's an interesting story from South Australia that a few uh, Patreon users and a uh, few people on YouTube have sent me. Uh, it's a fantastic story. The, the, the local government in South Australia have just announced a 150 megawatt solar thermal power plant. That isn't solar PV, but photovoltaics, that's solar thermal. That is what I saw in America. You may have seen it with the stuff I saw on the BBC. That is uh, either mirrors or reflectors that heat molten salt that heats water, that drives a turbine, a very traditional power plant, like a, a gas or coal power plant. This heats molten salt to phenomenal temperatures. You're talking two and a half thousand degrees centigrade. This is stored in vast underground tanks, which means that the uh, a solar thermal plant runs very, very close to 24 hours a day. Not quite, but it runs for an eight or nine hours after the sun has gone down. So in the evening, it's still generating as much power as it does in the day. Uh, the decision came about from a long period of activity by locals, this is around Port Augusta in South Australia, who knew that, that plans were being drawn up to, to build a very large gas, a gas turbine plant. Uh, and they didn't want that in their locality. Uh, they, very got, they got very active, they held a local vote, and 97% of locals voted for a solar thermal over gas. So the South Australian government has signed a 20-year contract. It's the American company Solar Reserve because it was the lowest cost option of shortlisted bids for this project. The lowest cost. It was cheaper than building a gas plant. So the plant will deliver 495 gigawatt hours of completely emission-free electricity every year or 5% of South Australia's total demand, which is not bad. But finally, finally, I, wanna, I just want to talk about big concrete balls. Well, it's the last thing, and I'm very immature, and it, it, this, this story really caught my eye. Big concrete balls in Germany, big German concrete balls. Because a German research group have recently finished a successful trial of a large concrete ball that they sunk into a lake. Using excess wind power, they pump air into the ball, removing the water. The air is under high pressure due to the weight of the water, and when they want the power back, they release the air, which drives a turbine, which, uh, as the air escapes, and that generates electricity. The test ball that they've sunk, this is only a mid-sized big German ball, it's, it's a three-meter diameter concrete ball. The next version will be 30 meters across, uh, 
and when placed 700 meters underwater, the team estimate that it could effectively store 20 megawatt hours of electricity. The Institute admits that the economics of this project only work on a large scale. Mm, quelle surprise. It estimates that more than 80 spheres would be needed to achieve a relevant overall performance um, for the energy market. So well, now I think the story will be that if we sink all these concrete balls into the sea next to wind turbines, it will raise the sea level. Yeah. It won't be global climate warming change. It will be big German concrete balls that will ruin the world. I don't think so. I think we'll be okay for now. Anyway, that's all I've got time for. Thank you very much for watching. Uh, please do, you know, have a subscribe to the old Fully Charged or click the little bell thing above the video. And even if you're feeling of a mind, you could even have a look at the Patreon support page. The link is down below this video. Uh, and as always, if you have been, thank you for watching.